All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, we are joined by our special guest, Dinkanesh. You are wonderful, a.k.a. D. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me here today. Of course, of course. Uh, Dinkanesh or D&I really got to know each other while working on on Habasha LA. And I, I do want to maybe ask her about that. But before we get into that, one of my favorite things about D is that she reps the 818 hard. And oh, it's yeah. so crazy to me that we're from the same set. We're from the Valley, the SFV, San Fernando Valley. But somehow we didn't really know each other uh, growing up. I don't know, maybe I'm an old man and that's why. But uh, tell tell me a little bit about that. Cause yeah, you got to yet it on you too. Tell me what it means for you to be be from LA, but rep the the eight one eight because it doesn't get all the love in the movies. We get mentioned, but not always the love. <laughs> That's true, um, man. The eight one eight is just home for me, but I personally think it's the greatest place ever. Um, you're still from LA, but it's not too LA. It's not it's not quite the suburbs. It, it's but it's where all the actions at. Like you said, it's in all the movies. All the recording studios are there. All the dance studios are there. Probably some of your favorite artists and celebs live in the valley, but no one ever know what the valley is. So it's like it's low key. I'm low key. Um, I just personally think it's the best place to be. Like so, North Hollywood. Woo, woo. Hey, get it. I, I went to middle school out there. Um, I'm from Van Nuys, but that's it's not too far away. Actually, one of the funny things about Van Nuys and North Hollywood is it's two of it's I don't you know, let's not pretend it's not the roughest parts. I said the roughest parts are East Side Valley, which is north of Van Nuys, Panorama City, Pacoima, Silmar. Those are the roughest parts. But of the so-called nicer parts and especially of the larger parts, Van Nuys and Northridge, some of the largest Van Nuys got its own airport, jail, everything. Um, Van Nuys and North, uh, Hollywood had their own subsections that I used to, it used to crack me up. Like where I used to live was on the border of Sherman Oaks and they try to secede from Van Nuys. And when I lived there, they never succeeded, but I heard later on that they actually did. And then I know there's some people who call themselves Lake Balboa, but that's not really like a place on the map. It's a place to make their real estate go up. And I know the North Hollywood equivalent is folks who call their place Valley Village and things like that, where you type Valley Village, it doesn't really correspond to somewhere. You can't really put that on, on your address because it's technically still in North Hollywood. Yeah, that, that's the bougie folk. I don't know if you ran into those, those bougie folks from uh, North Hollywood. Not quite, nah. <laughs> no, nah. Uh, the people I grew up with in North Hollywood, they wouldn't be repping no Valley Village. So does that also apply to Valley Glen? Or is that yep. like a, a place yep. on a... That's another so fake one. Pop up on Google Maps if you look it up? Last I checked, it did not. It's one of those things, again, to make your real estate sound better because... North Hollywood and Van Nuys cover such a swath of land that some of those are lower income and the people with higher income are trying to separate themselves. They don't want their houses associated with that because they're trying to increase the value. And, you know, you could on one level, you could respect anybody trying to hustle up the value of their house. But on another level, like, let's not pretend. What are we doing here? Right. <laughs> You're still in North Hollywood, bro. <laughs> yeah. Valley Glen. That's a good one. I forget them. They have a lot of these kind of like sub district, sub category names. Um, yeah. But, but anyway, you mentioned the studios and I think that's such a crucial thing. People were celebrating Nipsey Hussle RIP's uh, birthday recently. Just last week I was in Lamert, our, our mutual girl Addis was uh, celebrating some events out there. Yeah. I was out there in the early day. We were hitting in the, when it was 100, uh, me and my cousin Jonathan were out there. You, you, you probably went later at night than we did. Yeah. Like around three, four. Oh, that's when we left. That's when we left. We got there at like, you see, it, the event said it started at 11. So we got there probably one and left by three, four. So, you know, even us, we got there two hours late, quote unquote, it's, you know, but we got there in the heat of the day. Uh, so, yeah, we just missed each other. But in celebrating Nip, one of the things he talks about, you know, a, a couple times in his songs. And if you hear his interviews, a, a, a lot of conversations he's had, I've, I've followed up. I've been a super fan since 09. He talks about going to Burbank for the first yeah. time. And, and that's how sometimes people consider that the outer is. Sometimes people consider Burbank his own thing. I don't know. I'll get your opinion on that because you're closer to Burbank than I was. Do you consider Burbank part of the valley or is it outside? 
it, it's definitely part of the valley, like geographically. <laughs> but um, as far as everything else, Burbank is its own thing. And I think they like to, pref they prefer being their own thing. Like they got their own cops. They got their own, I don't know, like everything, like their own little government system. Like Burbank, <laughs> their people is just different too. Like us North Hollywood people and Burbank people, we don't necessarily, yeah, nah. <laughs> really? See, that's funny because in my head, like growing up, I categorized like North Hollywood, Studio City, Burbank as the same people because it seemed to be that that's where most of the creatives were. Because the more west you go in the valley, the more it's just like families, whereas yeah. you have a lot more individuals, adults, screenwriters, actors, everybody trying to make it big in Hollywood who either can't afford to live in Hollywood in the nicer parts or who doesn't want to live in the rougher parts of maybe East Hollywood or something like that. So, you know, even the name North Hollywood is, is a misnomer to some people because they don't realize that there's a big canyon in between. So it's not yeah. just like the northern part of Hollywood, but like there's a whole canyon in between a few miles that you got to drive with a lot of traffic on on some mornings. But Nip used to talk about how he'd go to some studios in Burbank and and elsewhere in the valley, you know, he'd have somebody do his tats, some essay do his tats or something like that. So, you know, you have various artists who kind of, again, they mention it on the side. And for those with ears who hear, like like you and I, who, who know these areas pretty well, we're, we're familiar. We know that that happens. But I know you've, you've worked with uh, various artists and and in studios what what is it like you know tell, tell us a little bit about about the scene about like how how people you know get studios and where you know which studios like how do you pick is there like an app that tells you which studio to go to or how, how do you how do you navigate that um actually i think there is an app um i forgot what it's called but there's a website that you can find studios in the area it's pretty cool it's like the airbnb of studios um but it's mostly like you just link up with the homies, you catch a vibe. Um, some producers work out a certain uh, studio. So you're working with that producer. You end up going to that studio. Um, yeah. I mean, personally, I had a studio myself in North Hollywood. Um, That's dope. So a lot of sessions I did with the artists I worked with, we just worked out of the studio I had, um, which was great during that time period. But if not, mostly it's just, yeah, you just know people who know people who got a studio somewhere, you're bouncing around studios. Um, but if not, you're booking studios. Like I said, you just find them like on that app. What, that. what do they go for usually? What's like the, the usual rate? We, we had, we had actually an Abisha MC on this program and he was, he was complaining about some of the prices of some of these studios. So he's talking about how he pimps out his car to be its own <laughs> studio or sometimes his home. That's what's up. Um, it varies. I mean, it depends on what kind of quality you're looking for and if you're looking for, um, specific equipment, but with the way that everybody has a home studio set up in their house, uh, studio prices have gone down considerably. Like, uh, you could get a nice studio. Like you're looking at like a major label looking studio, maybe for like a hundred dollars an hour, one fifty an hour to book a decent sized room. But if you're trying to work with a, you know, within a reasonable budget, you could try to find one for 35, 50 an hour though. Definitely get you right. Including yeah. an engineer too. It's definitely affordable nowadays. Dang, with the engineer, that's great. So, so tell us. Uh, I actually, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that, but let's rewind for the good folks at home. W you said you work with some artists. What What's your role been in the in the studio? <laughs> so, not in the studio uh, per se. Um, I own the studio um, just because I was working with artists that I was managing. Hey, um, on the marketing side, helping with rollouts and stuff like that. Um, and it's a struggle when you're working with artists because you know you have a budget you need to work within and. Uh, Studio time can eat up a lot of that budget if you don't have homies that you can work with and bounce around to at. So I figured it'd be a lot, a lot more cost efficient if I just had my own studio um, for the artists I was working with. And then of course, I'm uh, making it available to other artists who wanted to have studio time as well at a very affordable rate. Um, but yeah, so my capacity in working with artists was just helping them roll out their projects, um, managing them, getting them booked for gigs, um, making connections here and there, trying to get them with some sponsorships, um, trying to make some plays, trying to get them to grow their following, their fan base, um, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one time we celebrated your birthday and you actually did your birthday downtown and you said, you know what? Like, I don't even want me to be the focus per se. I'm going to have my artists, like I'm going to put some shine on the, my artists even through my birthday. And you turned your, uh, like a celebration of you into like a concert downtown. T tell the good folks about that. Cause I think that was like a really creative and, and good idea, a highlight of like some of the cool things that I've seen you've been doing over the years. 
I appreciate that. Yeah, so the event was called WCW. I did it the day after my birthday. Um, it was at the Mayfair Hotel. Shout out to the good folks at the Mayfair. Um, so basically, I like you said, I didn't want the highlight to be about my birthday. So I created WCW, um, Women, you know, Women Crush Wednesday, but it wasn't on a Wednesday. Um, but it was an all-female lineup, um, with the exception of the homies that I just threw on there, who <laughs> were two guys. Honorary. Um, yeah, they're honorary. <laughs> but yeah, it was all female DJs. We had Novena Carmo. We had Shasa Payne, um, Marley. We had, um, what else did we have? Those were the two DJs. And we had Semi performing. Shout out to Semi. And then we had Dad Attraction, um, which are the two homies that are not the women. <laughs> but yeah, it was an all female lineup with the exception of them two. And it was dope. We had DJs spinning. We had good folks, good people coming through. Um, Good vibes. It was good vibes. How to? It was a, yeah. It was good vibes. <laughs> that was right. Yeah. You 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 were talking about earlier too in the studio time to reconnect about catching a vibe and there's got to be a balance between trying to be a perfectionist working with the audio engineer who themselves might be a perfectionist who themselves might be motivated depending on if you're if you're paying them per project or per hour about how long they're in the studio. So I gotta ask like. How long is a is a vibe session when you're when you're trying to make music? You know, do do these times vary wildly by artist, or are there are there certain generalities you could talk to? Like, oh, we we go in for an hour, we go in for three hours, or we're in there for eight hours. You know, we, we're pulling an all nighter because I see you know some people talking talking about being in the studio all night. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely a thing. Um, but with those people, they're probably not paying for the studio. It's probably them catching a vibe with the homies, <laughs> probably kicking back. They got their weed, they got their drinks, they're chilling, they're smoking, they're riding. Like it's just a whole vibe throughout the night. They're working. Um, but if you're an indie artist and you have a budget to work with, that's probably not what you're going to do. So it really depends on the artist though. Um, a lot of artists I know, they write. Um, a lot of their things they rehearse before they go into the studio. So when they go in the studio with an engineer, they're just knocking it out because they know they can only pay for three, four hours. Um, some artists, they're in there, they're paying for studio time or they're not paying for studio time, but you're catching a vibe. If you're working with someone that you flow with creatively, like a producer or an engineer, then I mean, the vibes go faster than that. Like you guys are just writing a song on the spot, making the beat on the spot. And maybe in 20, 30, an hour, you have a whole track. Wow. <laughs> and maybe it's not perfectly done, but you know, you got the structure for a song. I've seen that happen before. Um, I personally, um, not that I'm really putting it out there, but I started songwriting a bit. <laughs> okay. No, no, yeah. put it out there. Put it out there. Let's do it. That's what this is for. See, I didn't even know. Let the folks know at home. We did not plan this. We did not plan it. I literally just hit D up and said, let's do something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. But uh, my brother's a producer. Um, so he got a studio set up. So we're just chilling in his crib with his whole setup. But we're there all night. Like, we're just catching a vibe. Like, oh, that sounds good. Do more of that. Or creating some melodies here. Like, we're having a brain fart. So we're like, let's watch some TV and just, like, clear our mind out for a second. Or go out for a walk and then come back. It, I mean, you can't put any boundaries or limitations on creativity, right? Like, it happens when it happens. Um, if it does or if it doesn't. So. It varies and it depends on the artists and the creatives. Yeah. See, what I like about you saying that is that this is a new move during the Rona and people, you know, people respond to the Rona in various ways. You know, some people could let it get to them. Other people, I am convinced, are going to come out even stronger than they were. Not that it is a good thing overall, but that it is a kind of a pressure cooker. And, you know, as people say, you know, diamonds are made in the rough. And so we're, we're trying to see how, how different people are tested. And obviously, again, like people have various family members, friends, associates that are affected. And it's not to downplay any of that, but I'm excited to hear that you have a new kind of music project going. I don't know how much we can get out of you about it, but is there a certain genre? Like, are we expecting MC? Or are we expecting the swoon R&B? What, what type of genre are we looking for? Are you All gonna right, hit well, us with some Amharic music? What's going on? I didn't necessarily say I was gonna be an artist behind the tracks. So I was just saying I'm, I'm songwriting. I, I wanna be, I've always okay. wanted to be a songwriter. Yeah, I want, wanna write for others. Um, but there's a That's mix. A good it's distinction. An R&B. I'm an R&B junkie naturally, so um, a lot of the things I write are naturally going to be love songs, not too lovey. I'm not trying to be on the sim <laughs> stuff, but <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely R&B. 
Um, but there's going to be some hip hop in there for sure. My brother, he's an old school hip hop producer, grew up in the golden age. Um, it's produced for tons of hip hop artists. So he has that flow to him. So there's going to be a, a good mix in there. Yeah. I like that. See, this is a distinction I think that not a lot of cats outside the industry appreciate. Me being a hip hop head from day one, it's something that I noticed that in some of the kind of the braggadocio, or you could maybe even call it a toxic masculinity, you will, of the of the obvious hip hop culture that comes out of the battle rapping and the DJ battling that we're now seeing kind of take place with artists playing their old tracks on IG Live and and playing their best bangers against each other. Some things that come out of that culture, for example, are the idea of putting down the ghostwriter or you know putting down Drake when he was rapping from his BlackBerry, for example. In the kind of artists you work with, and when you look at the the scene kind of writ large, do you do you sense that it, you know is is having someone else write your song is that a bad thing? You know, it, again, in in kind of a pure boom bap rap, I think some people still look down on it. But to me, it just seems like such an obvious fact that so many people have songwriters. But but you know the industry way better than than I do. Like. I don't know if there are, you know, numbers or anecdotes, but anything you could hit us with of like, you know, how many people are using songwriters versus doing their own stuff? And like, is it like everybody mixing a little bit of both? Yeah. So I think a lot more people than we realize do use songwriters. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you're over here claiming that you write your own bars and you're not, um, I think there <laughs> is with <no> that. <laughs> um, that's just wrong. But no, there's nothing wrong with it. But I agree. In hip hop, hip hop has always prided itself on like, oh, you're better if you write your own bars and you're supposed to have written your own bars and things like that. But I think hip hop has just evolved so much that that shouldn't necessarily be a thing. Now, if you're going to be a battle rapper, that that's different. Um, but if you're doing, you know, top 40 tracks and things like that, I mean, you're necessarily just creating a pop record. Pop has necessarily always had songwriters behind it. So I wouldn't expect you to have necessarily written the song completely. And I don't think there's an issue with that. Um, as far as um, R&B, things like that, um, I I usually assume that there is a songwriter behind it um, for some reason. It just usually tends to be that way. But yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's about, it, that it takes away from your talent if you don't write. Um, I think that being able to take a song that someone else written, wrote and you convey it in your own way is a talent in itself. So take what you will with that. <laughs> no, yeah, that's good. Like it's it's crazy because, um, you know, when I thought I was a rapper 10 years ago, I dropped the mixtape back in college and, yeah, you know, I, I did the everything. Right. And we I mean, we turned it out in two weeks. It was ridiculous while we had finals. You know, it was me and another dude. And we, we had a couple other people on other tracks, but the the thing, the kind of like big feedback that we got from it, you know, and I never pursued it, you know, religiously after, but the kind of big feedback that I understood is that there's a difference between the the presentation, the delivery versus the kind of the lyricism. And, you know, if I'm allowed to toot my own horn, I've always been a fan of lyricism. And like, for me, the content has always been the same. I've talked with some people who tell me like the lyrics are irrelevant. It's only how, you know, this, the, the kind of beat makes you feel or whatever it makes you emote in the, in the moment. And I was like, that's cool. You can have that opinion, but it's like so far from my own that it's different. I, I wonder, do you think there are any sort of personality? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Okay, I was saying, can, do you think there's a difference between the personality of the songwriter and the actual singer or the the person presenting and doing the delivery of of the lyrics? Do you do you notice anything? Um. So if you're a truly great songwriter, you're able to tap into the personality of the artist that you're writing it for. Um, and you know what they're capable of as far as being able to convey what you're trying to write about. So you're going to work with them in that sense so that they're able to, they're able to, 
I don't know, perform it in the way that you had created it. Um, if that does not happen, then I don't think that the song was necessarily for them or should have been given to them. Um, but yeah, the, yeah, basically. <laughs> oh, you, you actually raised the point that I didn't even think about. When you're songwriting, do you have a specific artist in mind? Like you're like, oh, I want to write something for so-and-so. Or do you just make something and then just sort of like, is it a numbers game where you just keep pitching it to different people? And so then like you can edit the lyrics later. It goes both ways. Um, sometimes you're asked to write a song. I'm not saying personally I'm at that level where I can do that. That'd be great. <laughs> but yeah, I've seen songwriters where they're asked to write a song or there's um, artists looking for placements for an album. So they'll be like, hey, we're looking for songs for so-and-so. Can you write a song that you think would work well for the album? This is a vibe. There you go. See what you, see what you can come up with. Um, other times you're just creating a vibe. You write a song that you think is great. And you're like, hey, I think Beyonce would be great for this. Let me pitch it to Beyonce. Um, and then if she likes it, then you would make the necessary adjustments or they would make the necessary adjustments and you got your placement. So it, it works either way. Yeah. Very nice. Is it does it work one of those ways more than the other? Like, are you are you more thinking of an individual or are you more kind of just pitching it out to different people? I think if you're thinking of an individual more, it limits you um, than if you were to just create for the sake of creating and then just sending it to a bunch of people with similar styles. So I can't necessarily say which one it is, um, yeah. but I, I think it's more limiting if you're trying to create you're going to be creating a hundred songs for a single artist. If you were just trying to get placed with that one artist in mind. So, yeah. <laughs> I love that. So we touched on it uh, where we kind of first linked up and, and met each other, got to know each other working with Ida B. Salomon, who's been on this program before. Could, could you tell us what was it that, that drew you to Habasha LA? Because it wasn't, it wasn't this narrow thing that we're talking about. It wasn't about go getting music space. I mean, it was part of that. Part of that was the same. But what was what was that initial draw? And it, let us know if you have any sort of anecdotes or stories from from that yeah. that period of our lives. For sure. Um, so yeah, like you said, the music thing that actually didn't come till later. Um, so when I first saw Abishale, it was on Instagram, I believe, or Facebook, one of those. Um, and I thought that concept was really cool because prior to that, I was thinking about. I think at that time I was, I was young. I was like 18, 19. I don't think I was even twenty yet. And I had just realized that I didn't really have many Abisha friends. Like I grew up here and I went to church here and there, but being in the Valley, my mom just never really had me in a community of Abisha people. If it wasn't for family or the occasional, you know, graduation parties. Um, so I didn't have that community or that sense of community. And I know that a lot of Abisha people out here do like, they always have that group of friends, not just their cousins, people they went to church with and all that. So I was like, where can I find that? So when I saw Abisha LA, I was like, wow, there's actually something or somewhere I can go to, to meet new Abisha people. And it, it was, it was truly like a community of like-minded people who were young, who were artistic creatives um, and who were interested in similar things that I was interested in. And I definitely connected with that. So I saw Ida was looking for people to join the team. Um, I reached out to her, but I don't think I had, um, uh, how do I say this? I don't think I was as committed to it as I thought I was going to be when I first reached out. It was just like, oh, hey, I could be part of this thing. Cool. Um, until I actually met Ida at an event. Never met her before, but I was like, oh, wait, you're the Abisha, per the Abisha LA person. <laughs> and then I told her about my interest in it. And then she was like, well, send in like a resume or something. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like this got legit. <laughs> like I didn't expect all that. Yeah. The community thing. Um, and then it just took off from there. And uh, Ida and I have been cool and been collabing ever since. And that was, I don't know, six years ago nearly. So yeah, but from that, um, yeah, I was like kind of into music before I met Ida, but from that, it also spurred my interest even more, particularly within the Abisha community, um, which definitely became an interesting thing. And now that's been my whole, <laughs> like a, a lot of what I'm I'm doing now, so. Yeah, I remember pontificating with you about, and I hope this is okay <laughs> to say, uh, like, you know, now he's gone. But for example, if we had some sort of like, you know, Habasha Coachella with Nip headlining, with Abel, you know what I'm saying, the weekend and all these, if somehow, some way we could move the 
the moral arc of the universe to gather all these people together, like, woo, like that would be something because it's so incredible. I think some of the, the kind of thought behind it is, it's so incredible how so many of us end up being so talented and creative, but like in isolation, like it's, everybody's isolated. And so, you know, now we see our, our friend Melat, you know, gathering folks with Habesha Networks and, you know, the various folks like Benny Hunt is in them gathering people with the, the Habesha comedy time. And I, I remember you yourself had one of these uh, projects. I actually hadn't checked in with you about it in a while, but uh, the, the 2591 Worldwide. First off, the title itself cracked me up because I've called Ethiopia so many times in my life. So I immediately understood kind of what you were aiming at. But for the folks who, who don't understand, t talk to us about kind of the naming of it and what that whole project was about, because that's directly related to this. For sure, definitely. And the project is still going, so let's not make it sound like it's deaded yet. Perfect. <laughs> um, so 2591 basically is, 251 is the country code for Ethiopia, 291 is the country code for Eritrea. So I combined the two, 2591 worldwide, because the diaspora is worldwide and it's directed towards the diaspora of Ethiopian and Eritrean descent. So basically it's a platform for Ethiopian and Eritrean creatives. Um, the tagline is everything our parents said we couldn't be. So everything creative that if you want to be a dancer, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a musician, if you want to be a painter, everything that our parents said we couldn't do because we had to be doctors and engineers, this platform is for you. Um, and what definitely pushed me to want to really do it is um, my little cousins um, talking about they want to be a dancer, they want to be an artist, they want to do this, this and that. And I hear the same things. Um, my aunt and uncle told me, tell them that, no, you have to go to school. You have to be a doctor. You have to be an engineer. You have to be a lawyer. And it hurts them. And I want them to see that there is different avenues for them to do things that they actually want to do. Like there, we have The weekend. we have Nipsey, we have Burhana, we have Amine. We have all these artists out there who are Abisha who are killing it and doing, and doing those things. But our parents don't necessarily want to put them to the fore, for, you know, uh, the, the, towards the, what am I trying to say? <laughs> the forefront. Um, but I think there should be a platform that does highlight them. Um, and a lot of the Abishai people on the come up beyond them. So it's, um, 2591 started off as a playlist, a podcast and a party. Um, we, our first event launched in, uh, ooh, I want to say November of 2018 now or 20, yeah, 2018. Um, it was a party. We had artists from around the country, actually. Yeah. Um, we had Simba from New York. We had Samsonite from Dallas. We had Semi, um, who's now in Vegas. We have Destadon, who's out here in LA. And they all performed. It was amazing. Oh, we had Ross Nebu. God, I almost forgot. He was the headliner. <laughs> and uh, from DC. Um, so we literally had artists from everywhere performing at Los Globos. And it was an amazing launch. And after that, we had an event partnered with Salam Central um, out here in LA called the Salam Mixer. Um, we did another Salam Mixer out in Oakland um, shortly after. And then we did a brunch party in Atlanta for the soccer tournament last summer. So we've had a couple of events. Um, we can't now because of Corona. Of <laughs> but course. we had a podcast where we interviewed a few artists. I saw um, those episodes. I'm yeah. a fan of podcasting. So you got, you got me there. And I'm wondering where the mixer was in LA. I think I might have been there. Was that in Samo? Uh, yeah, it was like Borderline Samo. Was that the um, what's that bar called? The Arsenal. Yeah, the Arsenal. Thank yes, you. that's my boy's bar. That's that guy's okay. bar. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, oh, I was there. Right. You made the instruction to. Yep. Help yep. Help and I was there. there. And I was there. It's like that yeah. guy's my man. He, uh, his dad was my dad's mentor. My dad came in, in the early 70s. His dad was here in the 60s. Right. So his dad was like the big brother to my dad. And then my dad was a big brother to him. And then he's the big brother to me. So it was like, it's intergenerational. Yeah, he, he's the homie. And he's he's a martial artist too. So him and I vibe on the martial arts scene. He's been doing Muay Thai for like 12 years and he did Kung Fu for like five before that. So yeah, he, he's the homie. Okay, well that's dope. I didn't know Abishas have been out here since the 60s. Oh, deep. There are a couple who've been here since the 50s. Professor Whoa. Efrem Misak, he's half Yemeni, half Ethiopian. He was like the first black professor at Harvard and, and at Yale and uh, and in Princeton, like all the Ivy Leagues. Like he's the first like black person that, you know, he, he was a token in that space for show, for show. 
and uh, yeah, so there there were some, not not a ton, but you know, I think my pop said one time in the seventies, he said there was like a hundred in L.A. and they all knew each other. Yeah, my dad came in the seventies. There so. you go, one of the hundred right there. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's dope. <laughs> So yeah, so so you you've had podcasts, you had parties, you had events. See, what I love about this is, and it's what I'm trying to do in my space that I'm creating. It's like the argument is not that being an engineer and a doctor is wrong. It's that, it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, because I think it's the same argument that I'm making and why I make this space. And I had an engineer on my podcast this week, so that's funny. It's like. Yes, it's a practical thing to do, engineer, lawyer, doctor. However, there's so many people that do not fit into that. And if you just try to push them into that space, they're going to rebel. And when they rebel, it's going to look ugly, as opposed to if you encourage them and say, you know, if you want to be practical, this is what you do. If you want to be, you know, artsy, this is what you do. And then again, it's not like that binary too, where you can say, you know, do this route, like study art, but then start entrepreneurship too, because that's how you can hustle your art. And then, you know, you could be an engineer, but, you know, take a creative writing class. So you know how to talk to people and express these ideas. Otherwise you won't be an awkward human being. Like, I think we need both of those, those things. Is that, is that kind of the thought, right? Like you're not bad mouthing people who want to go the, the STEM route, right? Like who want to be a math professor or an engineer or Oh, we need those. <laughs> please, if you love that, please do it. We need that for a functioning society. Like, <laughs> But if you don't want to do that, there should be a platform that shows you that it's okay, that you're not abnormal, that it's all right. There's a safe space for that. And I think that's been lacking. I mean, there's a lot of um, pages and people on Instagram that I'm seeing that are Abishad that are doing it and speaking on it as well, which I think is phenomenal. I think it's great. I think we are the next generation and we're doing new things. And in turn, we're showing our parents that it is okay. I think my parents are a lot more accepting of it now that they see that I'm going to hustle to do what I want to do regardless, respectfully. But I, I'm, I'm doing what I do. I'm happy. I'm thriving. I'm okay. I'm not struggling. I'm not <laughs> the failed artist that's the, the the norm that people think is that perception. So yeah, I, I think there's just that stigma to break and we're breaking it. And I just want that to continue on for the next generation. I like that. Building off what you're saying, there's a stereotype of the failed artist who's doing this because they're lazy. And if they were a hard worker, you know, they would have gone the STEM route. But the reality is when you uh, go around the nine to five life, or even if you're building your art on the side, you're putting in so many hours. Like, could you, could you paint for people? What, you know, what is, how do you even like log in the amount of hours you put in to all the various projects that, that you were talking about that you have your hands in? Um, I don't think you can. I don't think there is like a log that you want. <laughs> it's just like you wake up, you, it is life. It's just your life. Um, it's not a nine to five. You don't have your job, then your time at home, and then your family time. It's just your life, literally. So, I mean, of course, you prize, prioritize certain things for certain things. But yeah, like it's a, it's not a nine to five. It's a morning till you go to sleep thing. Um, but it doesn't feel like that if it's something that you love. It's just part of who you are and it's just what you do and you do it and you get it done. And that's what it is. I, I don't necessarily think of it as work. Um, there are certain pressures and responsibilities and deadlines that have to be met, but it doesn't feel like, it definitely doesn't feel like a nine to five. Nine to five to me was, it was sucking the soul out of me. <laughs> and I would rather put in a hundred hours a week and hustle doing what I love than putting in just a nine to five. So see, I, I, I wish I like everybody, you know, want to cancel him now and that's fine. But we were listening to Kanye in 2004 and in 2004, that was basically the message of college dropout. I was in middle school at the time. And I just, I remember hearing the lyrics. I remember repeating them, but it's like, I just didn't understand. Later on as an undergrad and then even in grad school, I talked to, you know, a cousin of mine here 
a friend of mine here who who made the same realization that you just said, like that there's something suffocating. They, I mean, they use the language that you're using about the nine to five. I later used that language myself and my parents, like they couldn't fathom it, but like it took a click. Like I listened to a lot of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, the entrepreneur. I listened to Dame Dash a lot. And it, it took like this click of, of their harsh words. They do not go easy. They are very harsh in their descriptions of the nine to five. And then seeing like other people like you, like other people living it, like living example, living testimonies for somebody who's still kind of trapped in that, in that world. And maybe they just don't understand what, like maybe they're suffocating, but they don't understand what, what that's like. Are there any telltale signs for you? Were there any moments or like situations you were in anything, any manager said at one point or time where you were just like, no, nah, I don't have to deal with this. Or like, when, when did, how did you come to this realization? You know what I mean? Um, I mean, it was, I was gradual for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So my very first job I got was when I was 18 and it was at Sears and it was during black Friday and I had to do retail full clothes and all that. And I, it was my first time working a job. So I didn't know what to expect. I was like, I had a clock in. I was told I can only have 15 minutes to eat and take a break. And I'm just like, why are there so many limitations? <laughs> I don't like this. Like, why, who are you to tell me I can do this at this time for this amount of time? So like maybe two hours in, I literally just walked out and never went back. I, that, that was it. I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but it wasn't time for me to become an entrepreneur yet. Um, uh -huh. So I got another job. Um, this time at a, a startup and uh, it was horribly organized. They had no structure. They moved to LA. They were starting up a whole new company, hired all these employees basically. And it was just horrible. Like I started off as like a sales rep, worked my way up to a team lead. I was promised all these things, yada, yada, yada. I had top sales members, yada, yada, yada. It was great. But then every single time something happened, something the manager did or the top execs did, it, it just... It was killing me like there was just no anything and the fact that i had no control over doing anything or making changes is what drove me crazy like i was just like why can't i just make things better if i know the things that could be done to make things better because i'm on the ground every single day you guys don't know what's going on it's just little things like that then i got my next job and then my next job until i got to my last job that i've had um my last nine to five um i got laid off <laughs> so i didn't necessarily choose to leave but after that, I was just like, I'm not dealing with this shit no more. Excuse my language. I I'm just not. You're good. No, this is a free channel, girl. This is a free channel. Yeah. So I was just like, you know what? I got to find a way to make it work because I can't do this again. It got to the point where I was dreading to go to work every single day. Like it was a struggle. And the fact that I lived in the valley and I had to drive to Santa Monica in traffic every single day, like morning traffic, afternoon traffic. I just couldn't do it. So just like you said, it was a gradual thing from the moment I was 18 to the moment I was, I don't know, 24. I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> it, it, literally, I could not do it anymore. And when you get to that point, you just can't do it anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I got laid mm -hmm. off. I think that was a blessing from God because I probably would have stayed there because of the job security. Um, and yeah. Here I am. I, I left. I thugged it out. I ended up starting a marketing company that I did not enjoy doing either. Um, so it started feeling like I was at a nine to five. Mm -hmm. I did it because it was, uh, it was able to pay the bills. And it was, um, I understood the processes that it took to get me there in a way that I could get there in a reasonable time frame so that I wouldn't be struggling. Um, but it, yeah, like I said, it still felt like a nine to five, but I just had to run myself. <laughs> that wasn't a great feeling either. So I left that. Um, a few months ago and I've been thugging it out now and now I am launching my own clothing brand at the end of the month called Eagles Don't Fly With Pigeons. Let's and, go. Yes. And that is what has me excited once again um, since doing anything music related. So I guess we're going into the fashion world now. <laughs> uh, see, that's what I'm saying. Like years ago, we learned from Chappelle's show, watching Wu-Tang, right? Diversify your bonds. Like you you got your 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 eggs in different baskets. And I, I appreciate that. Tell us, because that's powerful imagery. So you said eagles don't fly with pigeons? Yeah. What 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 do you mean by that? Or if it's a, if it's a totally under wraps, if it's a secret, we'll leave it a secret. But let let folks know because that's powerful imagery, especially in the United States. You know where the eagle is like the American animal too. 
definitely. Um, so, I mean, eagles can fly, pigeons can fly, but they don't fly together. Um, they have different trajectories. They go on different, they're going different places, different times. Like they just don't fly together. Like if you're, it's just a mindset, really. It's a mindset. Um, it's something that my mentor always told me. Um, you just, if you want to be with the best, if you want to be the best, you, you roll with the best, you fly with the best. So those are the Eagles. Stay with your flock. Be one with the flock. <laughs> so, I yeah. see. I, I didn't know you had a mentor too. That's that's a kind of another theme of of this podcast of of my life too. I've had kind of mentors for for different categories, and I think I think sometimes people think that you have to go it alone if you're choosing this non this kind of non linear non traditional path, and that's that's not necessarily the case. How how did you end up finding? Uh, a mentor and then why why'd you decide to you know to have one instead of just you know being a rugged individual for sure um it's actually funny i've never wanted a mentor i never looked for a mentor um and i have been that person who wants to be the rugged individual um which i think is what makes it funny and very ironic because i'm not anymore but i used to be the person that would be like i'm gonna do this on my own i got this Next thing you know, I'm like 10 projects in by myself and I'm like swimming and I'm swimming in shit and I'm, I just can't get it done. And I, I've learned that I can work with others. I can collaborate and it's not going to take away from anything. If anything, it's going to enhance the project. It's going to make things better. And on my and in my journey of figuring that out myself, I've had people come along. Um, just taking me under their wing and showing me different things in different parts of my journey and in different stages and on different projects I'm working on and just became my mentor. Like I literally didn't go looking for them. You know, when they say when the student's ready to learn, the teacher appears, I, I truly believe in that. So yeah, so I'm blessed to have them. I'm very fortunate. Um, I'm glad I didn't just reject them or, you know, when people come and try to teach me things, I, I always listen. And that's one thing I value about myself. I always listen. I don't care if you're a homeless person on the streets and people are thinking you don't know anything, I, I think you know lots of things. I will listen to you, um, whatever, like anybody I'll listen to. So I listened and they're still here rocking with me. So that's Very dope. That, yeah. That's real trait openness right there. A lot of people claim to be open, but I found a lot of, a lot of cats aren't in our family. We took these, these tests one time and I scored a 100. And I remember one of my sisters was like, that can't be healthy. Hanok. I don't know if you're supposed to be that open, but you know, I've, I've got an appreciation for anybody else who's, who's that level of open, who's, who's going to hear it out. And ultimately if it doesn't vibe with what you're thinking at the time, you know, you're not going to move it with it. Um, but you're, you're giving people the kind of opportunity. You're open to it. One of my favorite artists is uh, Jay Electronic. And on his album earlier this year, he said, if you want to be a master in life, you need a master. Now, some people might have a fence with the, the kind of his word selection there. But a mentor is a, a form of that, even if we don't want to you know, use that particular word. So thank you. Thank you for kind of even being open to that in a time where everybody's like that. And I'm just like you in that regard, by the way, I, I, I say the rugged individual, cause that's exactly, that's exactly my, my story as well. And so, you know, that has changed from, from having positive mentors, like I said, in, in different uh, avenues of my life. And this channel, I talk a lot about politics and language and Ethiopian studies and all these different things. But another one of the big themes that I think a lot of people don't touch and it's more my my niche uh, is is religion. Now I had Addis hit me up today and then I seen you talk about this too. Something caught my eye because one of my favorite Ethiopians of all time is Kudus Yared or St. Jared of Aksum. And I've seen, I seen both of y'all talking about this, but I, I don't know a lot about it. It seems to be an art thing and it seems to be going down in, in Lamert sometime soon. Tell us about this project as well. Wait, what project are we talking about? St. Saint, Saint Yared. Oh, St. Yared. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the homie actually. Um, Nayo. So Nayo started St. Yared. Um, it's, they can speak on it better than I can, of course, but um, uh, I know particularly Nayo doesn't like me calling it a comic, uh, but it is a series of characters <laughs> that are um, based on Ethiopian um, culture. So you have Jemina, you have Mesop, you have um, 
there's that one character I can't remember the name of, um, <laughs> but you have these characters that are based on things that we know of in the culture and there's a whole storyline to it. So Nayo is creating a comic series of it, but it's also in the form of a clothing line. So you can purchase the clothing at saintyera.com or some, I'm assuming. Um, but yeah, it's a really dope concept. Um, there's animations that are going to be coming out soon. Um, basically, Nayo is trying to create the Ethiopian version of like Walt Disney. Um, which I don't think we've seen, uh, at least within the diaspora. So it's a really dope concept. Um, I go, I fuck with it the long way. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, cause there's a funny thing, right? Like historically, you know, the, there's the church and the church has this, uh, the Orthodox church has the access like to all these saints, all these lives of the saints. And then one day, I don't know when they started in history, you have Kudus Georgis, right? St. George beer company. And then you wait a little bit and I started going to these Habasha events, like you're saying, and I saw somebody in America, I don't know who it is. They say, okay, we're going to do St. John. So now there's St. John and now St. John is another beer company. And I was like, okay, okay. St. George is a beer company. St. John is a beer company. And then I saw St. Yadid again. St. Yadid is personally, he's my favorite saint too. So I saw that. I had no idea what it was about. And so I wasn't sure if you were a part of that or if my girl was a part of that or or what was exactly uh, going on there. So that's that's why I was asking you about that. I, was, I just keep seeing the saints coming up with different uh, creative projects. And I was like, okay, okay, that's what's going on. That's all Nayo. Nayo's a very talented um, artist designer um, based out of the DMV, out of Philly, actually. Uh, yeah, Philly. Yeah, so shout out to them. Perfect. So um, this this has been great. I'm a Ganalo. If you have any sort of parting words or any other projects you want folks to look out for or anything to plug let's let's plug anything specific to you like uh if there's any sound clouds of anybody you ever worked with or any anything anything youtubes you want us to point us to or websites let's let's talk about it for sure. Yeah, I'm going to shout out 2591 Worldwide. Um, we've been on a hiatus for a bit, but I'm rebranding everything content-wise. So we're going to have a ton of new stuff. Um, artist interviews, artist performances, live performances, all that good stuff. So that's going to be coming out soon, hopefully in the later part of the year. So check that out um, on socials, 2591 Worldwide, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook, and Twitter. So check that out. Um, this has been dope. Like I, well, hopefully when this all over, we'll, we'll be able to link up for, for some more events. And even in the interim, you know, we, we pull up on each other with the masks and the social distancing. Oh, yes. Anytime. Just hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care.